You sit down at the table, a little bit nervous, maybe it's your first time playing. You place your bet, the dealer smiles at you and hands you two cards, two cards to your fellow players, and one card face up for themselves. They look to you and ask, do you hit or do you stand? And you look at the dealer, you look at your fellow players, and all of these people can give you advice, but in the end, the decision is yours. But that, my friends, is why you have me. I'm Professor Cunningham, and welcome back to the Mathematics of Vice. Now, if you don't remember the rules of blackjack from last video, I'll go ahead and put those up right now, as well as links to both of the previous videos on cards and probability, so that anybody who hasn't seen those yet can get caught up before going forward. Now, if you've ever tried to get into blackjack before, you've probably seen a table that looks something like this. I know I saw this table when I first started getting into blackjack and it intimidated the hell out of me. This table does give you a blueprint for exactly what to do in any situation that you might face at the blackjack table. But I don't know about you, I'm not the kind of person who likes memorizing tables. My method, or at least the method I use, I obviously didn't make it up, the method that I use doesn't require you to do a bunch of probability calculations in your head, and it doesn't require you to memorize any tables. I have five fairly straightforward rules that summarize my basic strategy for a hand of blackjack. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. The first rule is pretty straightforward. If you have less than 12, always hit, because no matter what, you've got a 0% chance of going bust, by hitting. In a similar vein, if you have 17 or more, you should basically always be standing. Once you hit 17, the chance of going bust is pretty high, and that only gets higher the higher total you have. Now, like all rules, this rule does come with some exceptions, specifically in the case of soft totals. When you have an ace as a part of your total, you get a lot more options as to what to do because you have both the safety of having a 0% chance of going bust and possibly the advantage of having a high total, um, which you can use to defeat the dealer. And already we've taken care of an awful lot of the situations we're going to see at the blackjack table. With just one rule, we've already managed to take a lot of the guesswork out of this game. With that said, rule two involves what to do when the dealer is showing a two through a six. If the dealer's face-up card is a two, three, four, five, or six, you want to play conservatively because, again, there is every chance that the card underneath that card that's face down is a 10. And after that, the dealer has a fairly good chance of going bust. Obviously, it's not a sure thing, but you want to stay in the game long enough to give the dealer a chance to go bust. And the higher the value shown within this range, the more conservatively you should play. If I'm playing against a dealer that's showing a six, I will almost always stand, except where that first rule is involved. Rule three is very similar. When the dealer is showing a seven or better, play a little bit more aggressively. Remember that when a dealer has a seven or better, they have a chance to win the game outright just by turning over that card. And again, the higher value that the dealer is showing within this range, the more aggressively you want to play because you are now in a bid to beat the dealer's total rather than playing it safe and hoping that the dealer is going to go bust. Now my fourth and fifth guidelines concern rules of the game that we haven't covered yet, so let's go ahead and do that. My rule four is split exclusively on aces and eights. Now, what does split mean? Well, if you are given a pair of cards in blackjack as your first two cards and they are the same value, you are allowed to split those two cards essentially into two separate hands and play each one separately. Now, when you do this split, you have to bet the same amount that you have on your original hand on each split. So essentially, you're doubling your bet and you're playing each hand separately as though you were two different players. The reason that you do this specifically for aces and eights, well, if you have a pair of aces and you split them into two, not only do you have two chances to win the game, but you have two chances for a blackjack with that wonderful three to two payout. So that makes sense for aces, but what about eights? Well, the reason why you want to split on a pair of eights is basically the fact that a pair of eights makes 16, and 16 is one of the worst places that you can be as a blackjack player. 
It's a low total that's very easy for the dealer to beat, but it's also high enough that it's very risky to hit. So by splitting up your hand, not only are you avoiding that 16, at least for now, but you're giving yourself a chance to get maybe a couple of 18s, which would be a pretty strong place to be. My final rule concerns doubling down, or doubling up, or just doubling, depending on who you ask and where you go. You may have heard of the phrase doubling down in politics as, let's say, someone has a certain opinion, other people don't like that opinion, and the politician doubles down by reaffirming that opinion more strongly because they believe that they are in an advantageous position. In blackjack, the act of doubling down means to double your bet and restrict yourself to hitting only one more time. So you double your bet, the dealer gives you one more card, and regardless of the value of that card, you end your turn. You have to be very confident about the probabilities involved to risk doubling down, especially if your initial bet was already pretty high. The only time I really ever double down is when I show a total of 9, 10, or 11, and the dealer is showing a 5 or a 6. Maybe a 4 if I'm feeling like risking it. Then again, if the bet's low enough and I'm showing a 9, 10, or 11, sometimes I'll double down just for the hell of it and see what happens. So with these five rules in mind, let's go ahead and do some examples so that you can see how these rules play out in an actual game. So here we have a game with four players. The dealer is showing a two, and as you can see, player one has a total of nine. Well, if I was player one, I would hit without hesitation because there's no risk. Now, player two is in a bit of a strange situation because even though player two has a very low chance of going bust, they also notice that the dealer has a very low chance of going bust as well. In this particular case, if it were me, I would go ahead and stand because I don't want to risk going bust and not even having the chance for the dealer to lose. Player three has a total of 16, which I already said was a very risky position to be in. Because of the very high chance of going bust, I would recommend standing here. Player 4 is in a very fortunate position, having a total of 19, but also having a 0% chance of going bust. In this case, I would recommend sticking with the 19 because it's a very good total, and there's still every chance that the dealer is going to go bust. Okay, let's run through this again, except this time the dealer is showing a queen. Player 1 still only has a total of 9, so we'll go ahead and hit there. Player 2 still has a risk of going bust by hitting. However, the risk of the dealer winning outright by flipping over that bottom card is so much greater that player 2 should hit. And in fact, with a total of 10 shown by the dealer, I would even go ahead and hit if I was player 3, although I would not in any way blame you if you decided to stand. And finally, player 4 is going to go ahead and stay with their total of 19, even though there's every chance that the dealer has a 10 under there, it's much better than risking lowering their total by hitting. With these five guidelines, you will be most of the way towards maximizing your chance of winning in any given hand of blackjack. However, I want to make two notes here. Thing number one, all rules have exceptions, and these rules are no exception to that. There are edge cases that you might well want to memorize just so you know what to do when it's not entirely clear. Secondly, I don't want you to feel like I'm deceiving you here. Even with perfect strategy, the chance of winning any given blackjack hand is right around 42%. Yes, that means that even when you follow these rules perfectly, even if you follow the chart perfectly, even if you're somehow able to calculate all the percentages in your head perfectly, you are still going to lose more games than you win. So what's the point, then? Isn't it just a loser's game, then? If you're just going to lose more often than you win, why would you play at all? Well, it turns out there is more going on here than just what is happening in one hand of blackjack. In my next video, I am going to talk about how we offset that low win percent chance with smart betting that focuses on incremental gains rather than hoping for a giant score all at once. With my betting strategy, along with this basic blackjack strategy, you should be able to give yourself a reasonable chance of spending a weekend in Vegas or Atlantic City or wherever your nearest casinos are, 
and at least making yourself a couple of hundred bucks that you can use to maybe see a show or upgrade your room. Just remember that gambling is pay to play, and you should never gamble money that you can't afford to lose. Thank you very much for watching this episode of The Mathematics Advice. Please do hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're interested more in math and how it relates to real world and not just the areas of vice, you can take a look at my other channel, which is just called Professor Cunningham, where I have a curriculum that is intended both for students of mathematics as well as anybody interested in how mathematics interacts with the real world. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.